In this uh, next session, you heard some amazing things this morning, some challenges were put on the table, some moonshot thinking was asked for. I want to introduce now a friend, a colleague, uh, John Werner. John and I uh, put together an event that many of you may have heard of uh, in lead up to this one, which is the TEDx uh, Beacon Street. It's a locally organized TED conference. So just like as the IEEE has uh, organizations all over the world and people that are coming together to do education, to put ideas into practice, uh, other organizations around the world have tried to, to take that network advantage and make it active. And John and I organized an event uh, in the Lincoln School, uh, in our school in Brookline, that's uh, TEDx, but it goes uh, to the world. And uh, Guru uh, Madhavan, our conference chair, uh, came to our event last year and he said, there's incredible elements that are happening here. This is what we want to bring into our space. And John's been a long time educator. He's worked in the education world, in the nonprofit world, in the for-profit world, in the product development. And I work in those spheres as well. And I could tell you a lot more about things uh, as John uh, has been doing, but actually that's what we're here to find out about. So please welcome John Werner. So it's a real honor to uh, present to this group. Uh, people like the giants, like Franklin and um, Edison and Tesla and uh, Grace Hopper, uh, some real uh, giants in, in, in the IEEE world, um, you will become. And you will become uh, partly because uh, you are looking forward. And it's exciting to kind of present some thoughts to you uh, that, that might help you on your, your journey. Um, so I have four questions for you. Um, First question, how many of you are part of a college or university? Okay, great. Uh, second question, how many of you have taken a selfie? Okay. Uh, third question, how many of you consider yourself part of a network? All right, last question, how many of you, has someone pulled you aside and said, I have some advice for your future? Okay, so um, my talk has four parts to it and they're gonna address each of these. So the first one is about a little institution uh, called Boston Tech. It was founded um, right where the railroad uh, tracks crossed in the mud flats in Boston. Um, it's now Copley Square. And so Boston Tech was this little building. It was kind of making fun of uh, a school up the street, Harvard, that was teaching science in a very theoretical way. And some people said, well, wait a second, let's do hands-on learning, let's work with industry. And so Boston Tech got started. And pretty quickly, Boston Tech overran the building. It was too small of a space to do what they wanted to do. So they said, let's move. And the plan was to move up the Charles River to a little spot uh, where BU is right now. It would have been uh, about the size of this room. But then someone anonymously bought a mile strip of land across the Charles River in Cambridge. And 100 years ago, MIT was founded and it went from Boston Tech to Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I would argue that crossing that river and going big, and, and this was the first building, it looks like one building, it's actually 22 buildings. And in this building, the different disciplines didn't have clear demarcations. And the engineers from different disciplines collaborated. And where a lot of institutions, 100 years ago they were founded, where uh, they had these different disciplines, they didn't, kind of do that collaboration. I would argue that gave uh, MIT a, uh, a competitive advantage. Uh, the other thing is MIT students are creative and they do these hacks. And uh, you know, that's R2D2 uh, on the dome. You, 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 may have, uh, you may know them. Um, the other thing that you may not know is that 70 acres were set aside behind that building, the McLaren building, to build mission control. And so when the lunar lamb was landing on the moon, they were gonna say, Cambridge, you know, we're doing good. But instead, it was Houston, we have a problem. What happened was John F. Kennedy passed away, uh, President of the United States was in Texas, somehow mission control <laughs> got moved. So this building that you see depicted here never got built. And so in the moment, that was a real blow to Cambridge. But I think in the long run, that actually was a good thing because that meant a lot of the innovative engineers that spun out of MIT use this, the vacuum that was created by this complex never being built uh, to do startups. And like iRobot got started, and now there are 100 robot companies in the area, and, and I think a lot of that had to do with this building never getting built. Um, let me also tell you about TED. TED stands for Technology Entertainment Design, and a guy named Richard Saul Werman founded it. 
And the first one was in 1984. It was so bad, that first one, that the second one didn't happen for four years later because they had to forget the memory of the first one. Everyone said the first one was really bad. Um, the first speaker that spoke at TED was a guy named Nicholas Negroponte. And what they were looking for was people to be interdisciplinary, to be able to cross, talk across these, these, diff these three letters. And uh, Nicholas is an interesting guy. He was an architect, and he was standing in front of a mainframe. And for those of you who don't know this, and many of you don't, you communicated with a mainframe with punch cards and so on. Um, he was standing in front of this computer with his stack of, of cards to get punched, and he looked at the others around him, and he said, you know what? This kind of technology is going to be the medium for the future. So he went to Jerry Wiesner, who was President Kennedy's science advisor and the president of MIT, and he said, I want to create a medium lab. But you know what, I'll, I'll call it in the plural. We'll call it the Media Lab. And um, this is uh, the Media Lab that got built. IMP designed it. Many people think it has to do with journalism, that media has to do with uh, uh, journalism. But it has to do with that technology is the medium for a lot of things in the future. And Nicholas set it up in a very unique way. He created these corporate partners and said, let's have them pay a fee and be part of a consortium. And then twice a year, we'll do these open houses. And because we have these extra funds from these corporate partners, we'll build crazy teams and we'll do uh, more diverse research. And it, it really worked out. Steve Jobs gave the keynote here. Martha Stewart did the, the catering when they opened it in 84. Um, and so uh, uh, the Media Lab started here. The other thing, Nicholas, Nicholas says he didn't say it, but a lot of people said he did say it, was the phrase, um, demo or die. In academia, a lot of you have heard publish or perish. You've got to write papers. You've got to you know, submit papers. And he said, no, no, let's make sure the demos work when the uh, consortium members are here. And if they walk out of the building and the demos fall apart, that's fine. Demo or die. Um, this is, if you look in, uh, you see the two doors. Uh, that, those two doors went into this room. It was known as the cube, which was a room that actually wasn't very successful. It was intended to be very focused on one uh, kind of activity. But a bunch of groups ended up working in there. And this became a hotbed for innovation at the Media Lab. And uh, this is E-Ink came out of there. Uh, these are the plans for a magic trick that some consortium member said, hey, wait a second, that would be good in a car. And this became the airbag. And so a lot of things came out of that double height ceiling, co-located space. And when the Media Lab um, built another building right next door, they said, let's make nine of these uh, spaces, very similar. And this is, this is one of them. And here's the, the new media lab. Um, there are a number of labs. I'm just going to show you a few. Lifelong kindergarten. How many of you have uh, heard of uh, Lego Mindstorms? That's because the mechanical engineers on campus were building robots, and the electrical engineers who were kind of lazy at doing axles and stuff were, were jealous. And, and so someone said to the consortium member at the media lab, hey, Lego, let's, let's, let's do this. And so it was very successful. But a guy named Mitch Resnick, who ran that lab, said, wait a second. This is expensive. Mainly boys are playing with it. Let's create something that's, that's less expensive, that, that cuts across gender. And uh, he created Scratch. And uh, Scratch is an on-ramp for a lot of people to do programming. Uh, the most internet activity on the MIT website is, is Scratch. And this is just w one day. I think there's uh, 100,000 um, posts a day in the Scratch community. It, it, it's pr pretty amazing. Another lab in the Media Lab is uh, personal robots. And uh, as we think of robots coming into our, our, our homes, Robots can soothe us when we're not feeling well. They can teach our children Spanish. And this group is kind of testing you know, what, what robots are going to be like in, in the home. Another group is Opera of the Future. They came up with Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Another lab is uh, Synthetic Neurobiology. And uh, they're doing optogenetics, looking at the brain. You know, Media doing optogenetics. You, you wouldn't have thought of that, but that's happening. Another lab is Changing Places. Uh, a few years ago, a bunch of people said, let's rethink transportation. Let's not just make it 1% or 2% better, but let's think about the whole ecosystem. So they came up with a bicycle and a scooter and a car that all worked uh, together, not for cities that now exist, but for new cities that are popping up. And one of the items was a folding car, where the engines are in each of the wheels. You get out the front window. It could turn on its axis, and it autonomously drives itself uh, to be parked. In that group, they're also thinking about robot furniture. Uh, a lot of people think about smart cities, but they're really tracking the cars. They're not thinking about inside the homes. And what if you can make a small space seem twice as big? Um, 
and IKEA is one of our, our corporate members, and they're really into that one. Um, they, these guys are also thinking about vertical farming, and this is a box car. It could go on a train, it could go on a, a, a shipping container on a boat, and it could, uh, you could grow 24 hours. Um, uh, and, and these guys are thinking about putting these box cars in city centers on big buildings and growing food where people are so you wouldn't have to pay for transportation and refrigeration and could totally change uh, the distribution of resources for food for the planet. And they want to make the Linux of agriculture. So this is open ag, this group. They also came up with these little uh, farm bots, uh, which are pretty cool. Uh, another group is biomectronics. So this is personal for a guy named David Senge, who is from Sierra Leone, where 3,000 of his countrymen are missing limbs because of a civil war. And so uh, David did his uh, research on, on um, 3D printing uh, sockets that fit. Because he, when he would go home, a lot of his countrymen wouldn't wear the prosthetics because they weren't comfortable. So he um, you know, did research on this and created uh, this device with a team and uh, created sockets that are hard in some places and soft in some places in a way that are comfortable to wear. Uh, and, and it's personal for the guy who runs the lab, Hugh Hare, who's a double amputee, lost uh, his legs uh, to frostbite. Um, another lab is, uh, by the way, is this interesting so far? Yeah, Just, yeah okay, all right, okay. Mediated matter. Um, Neri Oxman uh, is creating a Venn diagram of design, manufacturing, biology, and engineering and doing research in that space. And uh, instead of looking at 3D printers to print things, she's looking at nature. So she got 6,000 silkworms to create a pavilion. And imagine if you could take a seed and grow a house in the future. Like she's thinking like this. This is very Aquaman. Come on, fish, let's build a, build a boat or something. Um, she's also, uh, George Church challenged her to think about making a wearable if you were to go outside our solar system. And she created uh, this wearable. This is a uh, large intestine that can help you survive. Uh, and she also has a, a crazy diverse team of people who have all sorts of disciplines. And as you guys think about your careers, you know, just hanging out with just IEEEers is going to be to your disadvantage. You want to, uh, you know, expand your networks uh, beyond. Uh, camera culture, which is a group I know very well and did a lot of work with. Um, we did femto photography, trillion frames per second photography. We could see around corners. That was pretty cool. Uh, we would use terahertz to read books without opening them. We could see the ink on each page. And that has real health implications if you want to scan your body 24-7. We also would look at big data sets like Google Street View, and we had algorithms to figure out if neighborhoods were safe or not. Uh, and this has all sorts of implications. You could look at um, pictures of the back of your eye and analyze that. Um, so one of the devices that came out of this group was taking a smartphone because smartphone, the screen, the, the, the screens were so good that you could uh, use them in a, in a way that you could figure out your eyesight prescription number. And this is a big deal, and this is heralded as one of the top inventions coming out of MIT because 200 million people, while they can get access to glasses on the planet, they can't get to a clinic or a clinician or the machines to be able to figure out their eyesight number. And smartphones are you know, all over the place, and this is a game changer for a lot of people. And when our group came up with this, we said, well, wait a second. Instead of doing the research here at MIT in the 02138 zip code, let's go on the road. Let's do it in context, in the community. And um, oh, uh, before I go into that, this is another device. You take pictures of the back of your eye, one of the few places you can see blood flow that's non-invasive, and you can get predictive analytics on your health. You can do that for a region and distribute uh, resources uh, accordingly. So we went on the road, MIT student, here's a clinician who said, I work with babies and they can't tell me if they have limited peripheral vision. So we had a bunch of uh, engineers, young engineers, kind of like yourselves, who didn't know anything about health, working with a clinician, working uh, with our MIT team, and we created this device. And uh, President uh, Kalam liked it so much, he's like the Bill Clinton of India, uh, said, I want to meet these kids. And these kids uh, were showing how they uh, kind of solved the problem by collaborating with people outside their discipline. Uh, we also realized that uh, in India, every few years, there's a big event called the Kumbh Mela. And the city of Nasik has 2 million people. And for 40 days, 30 million people converge on the city and it becomes a pop-up city. And so we said, let's solve problems. Like, what's the Uber of sanitation? Uh, what's the Uber uh, or Airbnb of food? And so we got a bunch of young people 
to kind of identify ways technology could solve problems. And uh, we want to uh, uh, scale them, and that's what we've been doing. Um, so the Media Lab is not one lab, but it's actually 30 labs. And so a lot of you, I said, how many of you are part of colleges and universities? Does your college or university have this kind of range of activities? And if it does, plug yourself into them. If it doesn't, try to help facilitate them or work across institutions to make that happen. So that was the, my, my first point. Uh, okay, this is uh, a very famous selfie. Um, up until this point, this is the most retweeted selfie in the history of selfies. Uh, I think it's at 2.5 million. It was at the uh, Oscars. And uh, apparently Ellen DeGeneres was trying to get Meryl Streep out of the picture and she got in, the, I don't know, there's a whole backstory to it. But this is a very fam famous selfie. Um, so uh, I don't know if you know this, but a little fun fact, the first selfie uh, in internet was uh, typed when uh, a guy in 2002, um, uh, uh, September 12th fell and uh, he was a little, a little hungover and a tooth went through his lip and he, he wrote a friend saying, you know, this is a selfie of me. Uh, it's the first evidence of the word selfie. And then Sony Ericsson came up with a smartphone that had a front camera and that led, you know, a nuclear arms race of creating these, these phones that could take selfies. Um, but millennials, these are some ridiculous numbers. Uh, on average, millennials take three selfies a day that take 16 minutes. So I, I don't know what you're doing for 16 minutes to take three selfies. Um, you know, we took a trillion frames per second, you know, in my lab. Uh, and, and, and by some math, that's five hours a week creating selfies, 54 hours a year creating selfies. And you all statistically will take 25,700 selfies in your lifetime. And in looking at these numbers, I don't know if they totally add up, but I, I did pull it from a reputable source. But I mean, do you realize this? I mean, these numbers are ridiculous. So I take a lot of camera, a lot of pictures. I take about 20,000 pictures a year, and I'm sort of a hack, and I post my, my pictures in the cloud. And I want to say a few things. All those minutes that you're spending taking pictures of yourself also spend pictures taking out. So here's um, First Robotics. In addition to the stage where the competition is, I'm taking a picture of the behind the scenes. This is um, a ballet performance that I saw. I also took a picture, not of the whole lady, but you see the, the, the shadow. I think that, that, that's kind of cool. Here's Meb, who uh, ran the marathon in Boston, where I'm from. Uh, I also took a picture of everyone else taking a picture of Meb. And then I took a picture, and I zoomed in. And it wasn't until after the picture that I learned that he wrote the four names of the, the folks that, that, that died in the, the marathon bombing. Um, Here's a picture of someone looking at a life-size chess set that was pretty cool, and you, you could see the reflection. Uh, here's some IEEEers uh, that I took pictures of. Um, uh, the Mer Merv Minsky, uh, one of the godfathers of uh, uh, um, AI. Uh, Bob Metcalf, uh, Metcalf Law. I think he's jealous that Moore's Law is a little more famous than his, his law. Um, Tim Berners-Lee you know, does a lot with his hands. Uh, and here he is uh, a few years later. Um, here's a picture of uh, Mary Lou Jepsen, the uh, executive director of engineering at Facebook. Um, here's uh, Tony Fidel, the uh, uh, guy who invented the iPod, although uh, he debates, there's a debate about who really did it, but he likes to say he did. Um, uh, Sergey, uh, here's a picture of uh, um, Megan Smith, who was referenced a few minutes ago, but you see all the other people, you know, take a picture of her, that's kind of cool. Uh, Vint was here yesterday. Um, here's Vint with the inventor of Android, so I like the, 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 the juxtaposition of the two. I like the juxtaposition of this. A lot of you don't know this, but that's a television antenna from a long time ago, and you have a, a drone. Um, I like this. These are eighth graders from inner city Boston playing the football team in a game of tug of war at a local college. Uh, the eighth graders won, by the way. Um, uh, here's a girl trying to get Siri to come up on a computer that Siri wouldn't come up on. Um, here's someone who hacked a, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a bicycle. Um, here's my son who hacked a game of uh, ping pong. Um, polar bear, look at nature. Uh, you know, a lot of you, you know, write code or, you know, build circuits or whatever. 
Um, I stood at the zoo, and I have three kids, so I go to the zoo a lot, and, and someone told me, I don't know if this is true, but apparently a lot of animals depend on the hippo and eat off of the back of the hippo, uh, and, you, and when the hippo uh, goes to the bathroom, its tail spins a lot of its excrement, so don't, don't stand near there. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is um, the Adirondacks, and a um, uh, hundred years ago, some people put the Adirondacks in motion, a state park. It's now the largest state park. This is Lake George. And as you guys think about what you're doing and kind of like the selfie moment thing, what are you doing that's going to have impact a hundred years later that people are going to say, wow, we're really glad, you know, uh, people did that. Um, this is a family friend, and the day before, her daughter was just diagnosed with diabetes. And this is one of the first times that she's done the blood thing. And that's a big lifetime thing. And so that's a, a moment I captured. Uh, this is my first son. Uh, in the next picture, he's a little confused. He's a New York basketball player wearing a Red Sox hat, holding a football. Uh, so he's doing three sports at once. Um, this is my daughter. Uh, here she is again. There's my other son, my youngest son. And this is a funny picture. So this is Theo's birthday, but my son is blowing out the candles. And, the, and I, I was just took the picture, but I later found out Theo did not know how to blow out candles. So that's why he didn't know what to do, even though his parents had, had set this up. Um, Dean Kamen, many of you know First Robotics. This is him with his mom. Uh, Tony Shea from Zappos, I was at his house. And I took a picture of his wall, and this is how he plans what he does. He's the head of Zappos. Um, a lot of us you know, go by uh, homeless shelters or food lines and don't even acknowledge it. Uh, here I am taking a picture of that. Uh, someone using a minibus in a creative way. Uh, statues. Um, and this is my last picture in this section. But um, this is a guy I saw in India texting. And so, you know, we are a hyperly connected society. And this just reminded me of this. And he's using a, uh, uh, not a smartphone. So, um, I mentioned selfies at the beginning. This is celebrating the internet, and here are people taking a picture of the selfie, and there's Tim Berners-Lee in the center. Um, but as you take selfies, also take pictures of the world around you. And as you buy cars that have 27 cameras, as you accumulate a ton of images, editorialize them, and at the end of every year, send them out to people. Raise awareness, communicate um, in ways that it's not just about you, but it's about seeing connections. And I showed you how, I, how I've done that. All right, so that's my second story. And um, you know, in 1911, here's someone saying, I am here, because at the time, they didn't have selfie capabilities. They wrote on the front of the postcard. Uh, and last night, I saw one of you, and I don't know if you're, <laughs> you're still wearing your desk. You know, this is good. You're taking a picture out. Um, but if I had done a selfie at this event, which I could have done a good selfie, I would have missed this double uh, rainbow. So my point is, see the world and use images to kind of connect the world. OK, so next story, this is about networks. So uh, anyone know where this is? Yeah, this, this is about half of the 13 miles of Manhattan Island. So every 4th of July for like a decade, I would run the length of Manhattan. I would go from the top to the bottom. And I would run through uh, Spanish Harlem, Orthodox Jewish community, where Alexander Hamilton lived, Broadway. I would run, run it all. And um, it was fascinating to go from neighborhood to neighborhood, see the transitions in the neighborhood. And it was, it was just a ritual I would do. So you may ask, why did you do that? Well, I think it started because of my dad. This is my dad wearing the polyester uh, uh, light blue shorts. Uh, he and my mom both worked. And when I was little, they would offload me to my friends' houses for playdates because that's what they did. And at the end of the playdates, my dad would always come and pick me up. And instead of uh, taking the bus or the subway home, we would always run home. And I began to notice a pattern when he would pick me up from the same friend's house. We would never run the same way home. And I realized there's an infinite number of ways from getting from one point to another. A lot of people try to be the most efficient. And then I went to college, and I would uh, go in this library and study all about the history of the college. And I realized no one else cared about the history of the college because there's a lot of dust on the floor. And when I would come back a week later, my footprints would still be there, and there would be no other footprints. <laughs> But I would have all this knowledge that I couldn't wait to share with people. So every Sunday, I co-opted the campus. And I said, who wants to learn the definitive history of the college? And I would lead these like eight-hour marathons. And uh, you know, it was like uh, people would walk off in the middle. But I loved sharing. So then I moved to Boston. And, and this is Bruce. And um, I helped write a concept paper for uh, an organization where we realized inner city middle schools were getting out at 1.30 in the afternoon. 
so the buses could rotate back so elementary school kids could get home. And what that meant was uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders were getting into trouble. They were up to no good. They, they weren't being engaged. So a few of us said, let's add 500 hours on, to on top of the 1,000 hours kids go to school by running after school programs. But let's get the best and brightest engineers, architects, scientists, chefs, business people to teach from the textbooks of their lives using the city as a classroom. And that's how Bruce and I met. I asked Bruce, you know, you're an amazing engineer. You're really passionate. Why don't you teach solar car? And here's a dad looking at a solar car race where his, uh, his daughter won and went to a regional championship. And so we grew this from just Boston into being all over the country. And now it's a $35 million nonprofit called Citizen Schools. And IEEE is a, is a big supporter of it. We would get physicists you know, to teach the laws of physics. And it was hands-on, and it was learning by doing. It was great. <laughs> so this is how I got introduced to the, the TED events. I would go to the big TED conference, and I would show up, and I would talk to like Steve Wozniak. He'd say, yeah, I'm into personal computers. I'm like, yeah, I'm into democratizing teaching. And I would try to spread this big idea. But I would come back from those conferences, and my kids would say, Daddy, why are you away for a week? Are you part of a cult? And I would say, no, no, I'm not. Um, uh, and and at this, at, around this time, my oldest, Javier, uh, was learning about NASA. And he knew that I knew some astronauts, even though he never came to the TED conferences because it was TED cost prohibitive to come. But I would tell him about the astronauts. He said, Daddy, could you have one of the astronauts come to school? That would be really fun. And so I went to the teacher at the time, who did a great job teaching my son reading. And I said, you know, I can get an astronaut. She's hurling around the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour, but I can get her to Skype in. What do you think? And the teacher said no. So I unpacked that. One, the teacher thought I was lying. She didn't realize there was an International Space Station. So I explained to her, no, there really is, and I showed it to her. Um, then two, she didn't know anything about it, so she didn't want to be embarrassed. She didn't know if the kids would be good. She didn't want uh, to be embarrassed by that. And then she also said, you know, frankly, I'm not being evaluated in bringing those kind of people into kids' lives. I'm being evaluated on very different things. So that kind of turned a light bulb on. TED costs $8,500, and it fills up in 15 minutes, and it's harder to get into than the Oscars. And the first one I went to, this is a true story, I was standing next to Jeff Bezos waiting to get my gift bag, hadn't even entered, and bing, they said, congratulations, you've been invited to the next year's one. You have to pay in full right now. Who has $8,500 to do that? So I realized that I was never going to be bringing my kids to TED. But what if I could bring the best of TED to my kids? And so that's when Bruce and I kind of teamed up and started doing a TED conference. And we've had 500 speakers. And our first speaker was um, Sunita Williams from the International Space Station. But we decided we'd go one step further. We would flip the conference model. Every speaker that we had on stage, we would give them the opportunity to do a field trip where you could meet them, where people who heard this talk could invite friends. They could be multipliers. And instead of TED being a one-day affair like Thanksgiving, we could do it throughout the year at different times. So here we are with a uh, ectoskeleton. Here we are with a flying car. Here we are with a star on planet Earth. Here we are in the ether dome. Here we are with a guy that ran the Nobel Prize for 22 years and gave us all the dirt on who should have gotten it and who shouldn't have gotten it according to him. <laughs> here we are with three Jack Cook Kent scholars. And if you know what that is, those are people that they're trying to find the next Leonardo da Vinci, the ridiculously talented musicians, and we had them play music at Fenway Park in little nooks and crannies. It was like a Monty Python movie. Um, here we are with a submarine. Uh, here we are with Project Loon. I don't know if you know that's the top secret project that you may not know about, that um, Google wants balloons to send the internet to the last billion. And so we taught kids about that and said, what would you do with internet being distributed um, from above? Uh, and had them create gliders. And then we decided that we would get 100 people a year. There are 15,000 TEDx's. And we would say, 100 people, if you come to Boston, we will train you on these adventures so you can flip your conference model. Now, this is the last point I'm going to make on this. The reason I say that is you are part of a network of 440,000 IEEEers. And you're kind of shopping around. Is this going to be a big part of your life? Or is it going to be a little part of your life? Or is it not going to be at all? And the way Bruce and I have flipped the TEDx network to create a movement around experiences. We can go to the YMCA. We can go to the Boys and Girls Club. We can try to do this in, uh, uh, in charter schools. 
why don't you see this amazing, talented network as something to harness? The leadership of IEEE, and I've been to their board meetings where like 20 old people sit around a table. They do not know what Snapchat is. They do not consume data the way you guys do. They do not have the pulse on some trends that you guys are living. They do not take selfies at a rate that you take selfies. <laughs> I challenge you to think about how you can harness this network and be active in the network and make this one of your top three networks that you contribute to and bridge to other things. My last story, and this will be short. Um, so this is the movie The Graduate. Many of you have never heard of it. This is Dustin Hoffman's like movie debut where someone comes up to him and says, let me tell you about the future. One word, plastics. Okay, in 1960, plastics were kind of a novelty. They're a big thing and, and a lot of people made money on it. This is a movie I personally love. You may have never seen it. You should see it. Um, you're lame if you haven't seen it because it's so funny. Uh, and the movie is Fletch. And in the movie, I think paying homage to The Graduate, he says, it's ball bearings, it's all ball bearings. And as I triple ears, you're probably not happy with that. Um, so this is a typewriter, and, and I don't know if many of you know, but the keys as the interface um, was set up because movable type was arranged that way. And they actually made it less efficient so that it wouldn't get jammed. So today, we type on computers, on cell phones, based on, on some craziness. Now our eye can take in 10 to the eighth bits per second of information, and yet we are held hostage to this QWERTY keyboard as a way to interface, okay? So there was a guy who loved maps, a guy named John Hankey, and he also loved ships, and this is a ship that is buried deep underground in San Francisco. And you could walk right over the street and not even know it's there, the ship is Niantic. And he created a company called Keyhole that was bought by Google, and that became the foundation to Google Maps and Google Earth. But he got bored and he built a team inside of Google of 35 people and said, we're gonna be the Niantic team and they created Pokemon Go. And Pokemon Go is kinda of like Solitaire was for Windows 3. It's sort of a watershed moment to teach people about augmented reality. Now, this is a stat that shows you know, Pokemon Go is a big deal and will it be a big deal in the future? Who knows, but it is a big deal uh, at this point. And yet, augmented reality has been around us for a while. This yellow line is augmenting our, our reality in a football game. And a lot of you have heard about Oculus Rift and virtual reality where you kind of are submerged. You may fall off a building, so be very careful. Um, this is my last line. Not plastics or ball bearings, but I would follow augmented reality. Augmented reality has computer vision. It has big data. You look at the physical world and you have data over it. This is a $150 billion market in the year 2020. There are not gonna be many things in your lifetime that are gonna be this big. And yet, this could be co-opted by gaming and entertainment. But you all could think of applications for this to be the next interface of biology and technology. And so I challenge you to be leaders in this really exciting new frontier. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, it's great that you're in college. It's great that you take selfies. It's great that you're part of networks. It's great that you get advice. Um, uh, be the next Ben Franklin's and Thomas Edison's. Kick ass. Good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, actually, I covered a bit of ground there, John. Yeah. So <laughs> can I have four people just say something that they found interesting? So instead and of we'll asking have the lights me a question, too, please. just go, go to a mic and just, what is something, um, and you don't have to retell everything I said. You don't have to wait for us. Tell us uh, what's, what you think. What's one thing that, that you found interesting that resonated? Much better than the presentation I witnessed last night. Yeah. Which was great. I was one of the... <laughs> Speaker catalyst, yeah. Charles yeah. Rubenstein. Yeah. yeah. Karen and I witnessed this in yeah. preparation yeah. for today. All right, so what's your point on the talk? Thank you. It was so much better. <laughs> yeah. You incorporated all the comments that we had, yeah. and you really, you made our virtual reality a reality. So Great. thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Charles. All right, all right. so uh, all right. someone else react. What's something that was interesting? Yes. I, as someone who, despite being, you know, in the age of, people who consume lots and lots of data, I didn't get into social media or anything like that until I got to college. Holy moly, 16 minutes on three selfies a day. Really? So to see people consume data in such a way that I didn't experience has also been very interesting. So 
I do feel like an analog watch in a digital age, but I think it's interesting to see how all of these people meld together, even though they have such drastically different views. We love analog and digital. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's go. Hi, right. I'm Chen Liu from Ohio University. I just ha have to ask those questions. Those were wonderful pictures. Did you take it with your cell, cell phone, or did, did you actually have a professional camera to um, for those I, pictures? I did both. The best cameras, whatever camera you have, capable. Every January, I go through all my pictures and send my favorite ones out to my network, and it's a way to build your, your network. Uh, so take pictures. Um, Thank you. No. Yeah. I also take an uh, endless number of pictures, so next time I won't feel guilty. So <laughs> my phone gives a warning after seven days your memory got full. I have filled almost all the drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, Google Drive. So I used to zoom things. I used to take the photograph of the labels, what people are writing on, the, everything is stuff. Soon so, there'll be satellite selfies where you don't need a <laughs> selfie stick. So sometimes. And I, I just did a 360, by the way. Sometimes <laughs> I feel so guilty that I, why should I take so many pictures and I fill up the drive. So now I've got the reason. Yeah, but, but my point is it's not just about taking the pictures. If you're just taking the picture, you're no better than the person who's absorbed with the selfie. You need to look through it and you need to communicate with, with the images. Right. Okay. The next thing I will do, I will share with the people so that they could uh, get advantage of my view. Okay. So, uh, did you, were you, you. want to say something? I did. Um, and I really like um, <laughs> your speech. So, um, the Media Labs is something that I came across a couple of weeks ago while I was um, looking into encryption and uh, security and privacy systems. Um, and the Media Lab, you talked about, but you didn't really hit the topic that really interested me about Media Lab, which was the forbidden research section of it. So I was wondering if you could like, kind of mention it. Where are the lead future leaders, right? These are topics that we're going to have to be worried about. We're going to have to kind of put ourselves in the forefront. You know, we're going to be the faces of this. Yeah. Um, so if you would talk about yeah. the forbidden so research. So Joey awesome. Ito is now the head of the lab. And he uh, didn't graduate from college. So I think that says a lot about MIT. They're putting a director in the head of uh, uh, an important you know, uh, institution that doesn't have a college degree. Um, he actually said, instead of demo or die, let's just deploy. Let's create things that have impact that could scale. Uh, so that shows an evolution. He also created these, uh, this summer event. And a few weeks ago, it was, it was the theme. Uh, um, uh, Ethan Zuckerman uh, organized it was forbidden research. Um, so I, but, I, but I think at the end of the day, Joey wants to make the lab more uh, open and, and spreading things. Um, but, uh, so I, I don't know if I totally answered your question, but, uh, but thanks for, for that point. All right, any, so yeah, back to you. Yeah, so John, uh, I think there's been uh, many stages. You shared, I think, in your photography, some of the places that you've been and what uh, were the observations that you had. And also how, uh, you know, an event like this with a stage and the way that it's being scaled, that uh, talks like the ones that we do, you know, people are in the room just like we are today, but there's also uh, the, the presence and being able to transmit that information and to share it. And so maybe another assignment uh, that we should ask for is uh, when this information is here, we know that people have been uh, taking pictures. We had a picture of a picture, but there'll be ways to take what you learn at this conference uh, from this stage forward. And so that's another thing I think we want to ask for. Is there anything else you want to ask yeah. uh, from yeah, this audience? Yeah, you know what I want to ask? Um, so the point of my remarks were to kind of spark ideas. So turn to someone next to you and maybe just talk about uh, something that resonated or a question you have. Uh, ready, go. Take one minute. Did that go too long? Yeah, let's take a minute, then we're going to wrap this. I'm just trying to read yeah. the energy of the room. Oh, it's not mic, so. It wasn't just about pictures. Um, I'm going to connect it to the next What's that? Thing. I'm going to connect it to so the next thing. So should I get off stage? No, we're, just gonna, we're going to have to pull it back after a minute. So. Okay. so should I just say, you know, my goal is that, that, that you guys take something from this talk that can help you, you know, reach your potential and, and do more good for the what world? What do you want them to do with what they just learned here from their neighbor? Um, Continue the dialogue. Three? Okay. Where's the rest? Where is it? Can he come up here? Have him come up. Go get him. I'm going to bring Russ Harrison up. So can I go on stage? We'll transition it out.
So we're going to bring it back. We're going to bring it back. This is always the, the, the most, we get it started, and we get it going, and we bring it back. <laughs> so the most amazing thing is to uh, bring a, in a place like this and to have that excitement. And then we have to pause it. It's not a stop. It's just a pause. And so John. Yep. Um, good luck reaching your potential. I know I said a lot. I hope there's some things that, that you could draw upon to help you guys uh, you know, be excellent. That's from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, John.